Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, you'll hear from James J. Ward, a longtime abolitionist who has been incarcerated in Ohio for over half of his life since he was 15. Over the years, he's participated in the national prison strike of 2018, various hunger strikes, and movements against the abuse and mistreatment of incarcerated people. One of his major political goals is to educate the public about the struggles he and other prisoners face to create systemic change. Without a sentence reduction, Jay will likely spend the next 25 years in prison as well. Jay is currently raising funds to pursue his post-conviction relief so that he can reunite with his friends and family and begin a new life on the outside. Despite Jay's best efforts, he was not able to visit his mother before she died of an illness in 2022. He would like the chance to spend time with his father, who is also in poor health before he passes. If you check our show notes. My name's James Ward. The reason I guess for this interview is to hopefully tell my story to those out there of my struggle of being in prison and trying to fight to get out of prison. And I'm hoping to get that amplified to hopefully raise the funds through a fundraiser to accomplish my goal to hopefully get a lawyer. Yeah, so how old were you when you first got locked up? Um, I was I was 15 years old, about mid mid 15. And what has it been like for you since you've been in prison? Uh, well, when I first got locked up, it really wasn't um as stressful as I can say that it is now. You know, I had my mom in my life more more than I I have now. So I, I never really looked at the struggles then because, you know, I, I was kind of fresh in into the system and everything. And so things really didn't start affecting me or anything until years later. I can say probably when I was about... 18, 19, maybe 20 years old, going through the constant struggle of trying to maintain contact with my family, of how hard it was to maintain contact with them and to get their support. And I guess it was hard because the way that I needed them and the way that I needed their support, they wasn't there as much because they didn't understand the struggle of what I was going through. And also, it, it was a lot of ways how the tr- the COs would kind of treat treat me every now and then. Yeah, it's, it's 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 just it's been real rough. What was it like being a teenager, being so young, and being incarcerated among adults i can um <laughs> it was very confusing cuz at at first i i really didn't have much understanding of how they could like just put juveniles in a prison with adults for you know so long you know even even if it was their first time committing the crime. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're we're not even adults yet. You know, like, how can we even be, like, looked at as as an adult? Like, as a juvenile, we still have the ability to progress and make changes within ourselves, you know, before we, 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 we reach that stage of, becoming an actual an adult and being held accountable for the things that we commit as adults. You know, it's 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 a lot different coming in as a juvenile than coming in as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. And and one time you mentioned to me that you didn't feel like you had very good representation and, you know, support when you were 
first going through the court system. Do you want to talk a little bit about that aspect? Yeah, okay. Um, when I first got locked up going through the court system, I was provided with a public public defender, which later on I I kind of heard through other people that they're actually called public pretenders mm-hmm. because of the simple fact that they pretend to defend you. They they pretend to fight for you. So that experience was kind of difficult because the simple fact that when my when the public public defender told me how much time that I could possibly get. I tried to have him like talk with the prosecutors about possibly lowering the plea deal because the first deal that they tried to give me or that they wanted to give me was twenty years mandatory. And, you know, I'm I'm thinking like, okay, like I'm I'm like a first time offender. I'm I'm fifteen years old. You know, and so I asked if he can, you know, talk to the 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 prosecutors and try to get them to come down on the 20-year plea deal. Well, probably about like, if I can recall, like a week or so later, he came back in and talked to me, and he's like, you know, the prosecutors don't want to lower the, the plea deal. So I kind of became, I was scared because the simple fact that he said that if we go to trial, that I could possibly get up to 64 years in prison. Yeah. So so hearing that, I'm like, I felt like my only option was to take the 20-year plea deal. Yeah. And, yeah. So yeah, it, it was it was a lot of fear that I that I had experienced during that time. Yeah. Yeah, that's very understandable. How how long have you been in prison at this point and you know, what are if nothing changes, what is the amount that's remaining on your sentence as of right now? Well, okay. I they initially sent me to prison in 2006. So I've been in prison for, I say, a good 18 years. I think if I've if I've done the math right, and I have at least if if I do all of my time, my out date is 2049. Wow. Yeah. Because hmm, it was a point in time where I kind of gave up. And, you know, being being young, I, I was doing things in the prison that kind of got me extra time. Mm-hmm. And that, that added at least... I'm not really sure of the math, but probably twenty, twenty so more years. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you've had a lot of different periods of of different times where you were really low and times where you've kind of been fighting back. And you know, how has that been for you in the last seventeen or so years? Oh man, that's that's a tough question. Well, like like I was saying earlier, when I first got locked up, it was it was kind of okay because I, I really didn't put my mind to much, mainly because my mom was there. Um, but then over the years, I started experiencing the dis the distancing that was coming from my family mm-hmm. and the contact, you know, she, my mom started getting distant 
And I started learning that it was because it was it was hard for her knowing that I was going to be in prison for for this long. Mm-hmm. And it's it's been hard for me as well because how hard it's been for me to keep in contact and I like, try to get her to be strong so it would help me be strong. You know, that 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 was like one of the biggest struggles that I've been experiencing since being in prison because I've always tried to tell my mom like, you know, I don't I don't want I don't want things to end like this. You know, I I, I want there to be a better relationship between us before her time comes. Yeah. You know, and um it just never really it, it never really stuck with her because I she just really didn't know how to handle it. Like when she when she did right it would really upset her because the fact that she knows that I'm in here and I'm I'm not out there where I should be. Yeah. The um the many other obstacles that I've that I've faced I mean I I <laughs> from from needing to support myself from getting retaliated on by COs I've had my rib my rib broke when I was at Lucasville because three COs wanted to come into my cell because something that I had did in the past and they started beating on me with with it's like a little like a little PR like a like a Billy Club thing like beating yeah. on me in my head punching yeah. me in my rib they never got anything like any type of punishment for it you know because yeah. they did it off camera and when I said something about it all they did, they put me in the hole they did an X-ray on my rib seeing that it was fractured. Um, yeah, but the staff never got any type of punishment. But uh, say, like, the things that I do, I get punished all the time. Or the things that, that the CEO possibly writes me up for that I may have not have did, I still get punished for it, you know? So it, it's, a, it's a lot of different struggles and difficulties that I've been through and getting retaliated on. Like, when I was in the 2018 National Prison Strike, I was put in the hole for going on strike. And after that period, I had got jumped on in my cell by a group of SRT members, and they had dislocated my shoulder. So when I filed my lawsuit, about a year later after that, while I was on another hunger strike for protesting, um, if I can recall, it was I was protesting my my safety. Yeah, because some individuals was trying to jump me or something and I was trying to get out of the block that I was in and so I was I was protesting my safety with the administration. And during that time that I was in the infirmary, two COs came in and beat on me again then. But my lawsuit failed because the simple fact that the the lawyer that the courts had gave me basically just threw it down the drain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. You've been involved in various forms of activism for for a long time. Um, how did you kind of get involved in that, and what kinds of activism have you been a part of um, over the years? Well, okay. Uh, I, I can say I've kind of always had the mindset to speak up against, like, what's wrong, like, the things that the COs do 
that is wrong. And I'll say I kind of really started probably in 2009. But I didn't really get active, active until probably 2016, 17, somewhere around there. Um, Because I knew of organizations that was in place to help amplify prisoners' voices of the wrongdoings that they face in prison and stuff like that. But I was never directly involved with them until about 2016, 2017. And that's when I I had met another individual that was already involved with the organization called IWOC, which means Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. We basically got together and started doing protests, like hunger strikes, concerning, like, some of the various different, I'm going to just say wrongdoings that COs was doing, like writing false conduct reports or putting us in the hole for things we didn't even do, you know, like, stuff like that, like, um, and, like, okay, there was a, there was an instance where we was in the hole, and we was trying to, we was put in the hole under 4B status, that's, like, solitary confinement, um, and, where we was located, we wasn't allowed to get all of our property that we was allowed to have because we wasn't in an uh, actual 4B block. Well, we was trying to go through the administration to get our property because that was our right to have, like, our TV, our other, like, clothes and stuff. But the people that was over the segregation department where we was at, they wasn't allowing us to have our property. So we had demonstrated, well, we had put together a demonstration in order to, well, in order to hopefully get all of our property. Well, instead of accomplishing that, we got retaliated on and they gave us um, more 4B time, more solitary confinement time. Um, and I was actually, they actually ended up putting me in on suicide watch because they said that I tried to commit suicide. Um, and everybody else ended up getting shot with pepper, I think there was, pepper ball guns or something. Um, A lot of us ended up losing certain privileges. Um, Yeah, it was, it was different. (laughs) It was a lot of different things going on around that time that I really can't recall most of, but I've been on various different um, hunger strikes concerning conduct reports that was written on me that were, were false trying to get them um, thrown out off of my record. As I've said before, I've I've been beat on for voicing the wrongdoings that that I've encountered for writing up COs. Um, yes, yeah, there's many different things that I've that I've been through since trying to uh stand up for my rights and trying to get my voice heard and everything. Yeah. With with all of the political work that you've done and just your experience being incarcerated, how has that shaped your political worldview um, and your beliefs about um, incarceration and um, prisoners' rights and things like that? I mean, that that's 
that's another hard question. <laughs> I mean, it, it really did open my eyes to a lot that prisoners go through. And it shows me that it can be a better system other than the system that is in place now because the things that that I've been through since I've been locked up, I mean... I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people know that it's it's inhumane. Like, it's things that, that prisoners shouldn't even have to, or, I mean, it's just things that people, not just prisoners, but just people shouldn't have to experience. And, yeah, the, the way it shaped me is, I mean, I, I've, I've become a different person since I've got involved with, a lot of the the politicalness um before i I wasn't really aware of a lot of stuff like I am now, like on the political side i mean like i but like i said i i was I was getting newsletters and stuff like that, and i was I knew of organizations and stuff like that but i was I wasn't really active with them or communicating with them or anything. I, I heard about stuff going on in other prisons, you know, so from from that from that stage I was already kind of getting shaped into being my own um political person, if I should say it like that. <laughs> So yeah, like I, I, the way I view things now is a lot different than how I was viewing them when I first got locked up. Because now I, I feel like they should do away with prison and develop a a better system that actually helps people rehabil rehabilitate themselves. You know, for crimes that they may commit. But I don't feel like somebody should be locked up for for so many years to the point where they become somebody worse than what they was. You know, and I think at a point in time I have I have experienced that myself. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, now you're trying to raise money to work on your case. Did you want to talk a little bit about that and um and your fundraiser? At a point in time I've I've experienced myself where I felt like I was worse than when I first got locked up. And I, I believe that a lot of a lot of us prisoners go through that because to me I feel if if somebody is locked up for so for so long, they experience a point in time where it's so excessive on them, and it kind of like plays with their their mental, you know, because pe- people ain't created to be locked up like this, you know, and 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 if it's if it's so much. I feel like it, it can just it it can force them to become something that they're really not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like I've I've experienced that. But I feel like I've experienced it, but I've I've brung myself out of it. When I started getting involved with organizations that um they had shown me like a, a big difference. You know, they had shown me that, you know, they're, they're working on making things better for us prisoners. So inside, I, I feel like that, that gave me hope, you know, and I got I got involved with a lot of, of good people that to this day, like, I really look at as, as family. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and um and sort of kind of going off of an earlier question where you were talking about your time the time you have left here um on your sentence you know you're trying to raise money 
to pay for a lawyer. So did you want to talk about your fundraiser and kind of share what that's about and um, why you're raising money for that? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, it's it's kind of been a long struggle with, with that. I originally started trying to raise money for a lawyer to hopefully possibly get out before my mom passed away. And, you know, the friends that I had got in contact with after the national prison strike had helped me put up a fundraiser to raise the funds to afford the National Legal Professional Associates to work on my case. And it it, it took a little while to raise the $2,950 that I needed to hire them to do the research and everything. But we eventually raised the money and hired them, and they did the research and, research and stuff on my case and determined that the best possibility that I have in order to possibly get out, or I would say to actually get out, because that's what that's what they're telling me that they're they're going to get me out, but I just have to have I have to raise the money to afford the lawyer that they found for me. So they told me that the, a post conviction is what they're going to do, but I I don't I didn't have a lawyer or anything, so they helped me find a lawyer that initially he wanted. $18,000 to hire him and to take my case. Well, the NLPA, they know that I really don't have that kind of money, so they communicated with him and got him to come down to 12000 Well, still, that's kind of uh, a lot of money that I don't have, and I've been trying to do whatever I can to raise money, but that's also been a struggle. So uh, about probably a, a month ago, I got on the phone with him, with the lawyer that the NLPA had found for me, and I told him, you know, my situation, like, hey, I really don't have the money. Um, is there anything that we could do and I mean it basically came down to him saying that he can't do anything for me unless I at least have five thousand dollars up front and then we can work on some type of payment plan after that so that's what I'm hoping for right now is to possibly at least raise five thousand dollars so that I can hire him to take my case and hopefully get out of here before um yeah before my my dad possibly passes away too yeah yeah so you know with that um what are what are some things that you know you're really looking forward to um about being on the outside Oh man. <laughs> well, um I would really like to get the chance to meet my friends in person one day, uh, when I get out. But the most thing that I'm really excited about wanting to do is start my life. Get things in order for me, you know, get a job, create a, a new beginning, you know, and just be free, you know, instead of having all these stipulations and obstacles that someone that's not free has to go through on an everyday mm -hmm. basis being in prison. 
you know, being told when um, when you have to go eat or being told when you have to take a shower or, like, being told, like, to... <laughs> My family is kind of acting goofy right now. Um... Yeah, just being told to basically do everything, you know, like that you can't, like that you just can't do, like freely, you know. I I just I I want to be able to do things when I want to do them, like you know, get in the shower when I want to get in the shower, like eat when I want to eat, you know, like I want to be able to provide for my family, you know, I want to be able to help help my family, my, like my sister out there that's struggling right now that I can't even help because I'm locked up in here to where I can't even get a real job, you know. So, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm looking for a lot, forward to a lot of things and just, just getting my life on, on a, a, a better track. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Well, that that was all the questions that I had. But if is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, I'm sure we can probably do another another chat if you know if there's more stuff that that we forgot um, this time. But <laughs> is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? The last thing I could probably say is that I just really hope that this time I can accomplish the goal that I've been trying to comp- accomplish since before my mom passed away. I'm I'm hoping that this time I can raise enough money to actually get this lawyer and get out before my father passes away because I, I've already lost my mom and that's 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 been hard on me losing her while I've been in here trying to fight to get out. And I, I I just hope that the people that hear this can understand the importance, like how important it is for me to accomplish this goal. Yeah. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. KiteLine is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on KiteLine, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. 47 people in the U.S. were killed in mass shootings in the month of November 2023. That same month, 103 people were killed by cops, according to an incomplete list compiled by the Washington Post. These are their names. Michael Grimes, Benjamin Pritchard, Brandon Thomas Decker, Jason Pass, Rudy Isaac Chavira, S.A. Floyd, Christopher T. Sewell, Douglas Quinn, Paul Vincent Neller, Maximiliano Max Sosa, Jr., Dustin Allen Rush, Thomas Knock, Anthony Robert Barnhill, Zachary Wolfscott, Graciello Reza Contreras, Fleen Miles III, Mark Chambers, Matias Yosino, 
Jesse Brown Hernandez, Jose Antonio Medina, Tronza Campbell, Noah McGowan, David Bonino, Cameron Allen Eaton, Lloyd Dillard, Lance Christian Levy, Hunter Jessup, Justin Barrett McCarroll, Heriberto Penalosa, Robert William Berry, Chad McGraw, as Janie Owens Bay, name withheld November 9th, Sandy, Utah, Donald Wayne Ball, Daryl Fowler, Jaime Valdez, David James Umfreville Sr., Ahmed Mohammed Nasser, Japheth Torres Diaz, Nicholas Brewington, Joseph Michael Ramos, Randall Ed Jessam, Curtis Lee Lindsay, Rene Calderon, Imano Aparicio, name withheld, November 13th, Hagar Township, Michigan. Name withheld, November 13th, Los Angeles, California. Sonny Ray Holland, Sr. Bernard Russell. Tensei Peterson. Peter Luna Lopez. Name withheld, November 15th, East Bloomfield, New York. Matthew Alexander Rich. Joseph Dean Black. Jeremy Dale Adams. Richard Michael Piore, William L. Hayes, Marco Oslando Guerra, name withheld, November 16th, Federal Way, Washington, Freddy Robles, Leandre Cruchon, Houston, John Mador, Sean Luzama, Denise Sonia Palacios Pendulinen, Gumaro Isaac Acosta, Dachena Warren Hill, Jesse Dominguez, Nate Landrid, Ismael Reyes, name withheld, November 19th, Arlington, Texas, John Joseph Hampton, Alan Siebert, Charles Brant Staudenmayer, Joshua Mitchell, Jacqueline Lane Huff, Michelle Freestone, name withheld, November 20th, Nicholasville, Kentucky, Delante Campbell, Stephen James Murphy, Iris Dania Billy, Demarcus Brody, Christoph Christopher Wita, Joshua Reese, Skylar Wentworth, Arnell Redfern, Justin Jordan, name withheld, November 25th, Los Banos, California, Jelena Anglin, Pete Martinez, Robert Pitcher, David O, Matthew Robert Williams, Adam Lee Ibarra, Stephen Allen Lopez II, Gregory Skane, Fred Claude Perkins, James Salanoa, Jr., Jason Campbell, Osvaldo Cuelli, Lamar Deshaun Young, Lamont Bland, name withheld, November 30th, Houston, Texas. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org.
This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.